Thank you very much, Anna. It was a very nice introduction. So I will now uh, share my screen to start showing you my presentation. And please uh, give me some feedback about the quality of the audio and video uh, streaming. So uh, Tim, it was very good, uh, very nice to be invited to give this presentation. It was a bit surprising because this work has been uh, just submitted. Uh, it is currently under review. And we find this is quite interesting. And I'm going to give you a perspective about how we went into this work and what we found, and what we believe it may mean. But first of all, I would like to highlight that this is, uh, and we are very proud of this, a four continent collaboration. So we have had inputs from US, several European centers and China and Australia. And uh, most of the work has been uh, the, the brainchild of uh, Shun Li, a very talented neurosurgeon slash cell biologist and uh, Florian, all the oil And you may see that uh, they may not be more different in personalities, but uh, they have worked very well together. And uh, we have received also support from multiple friends and colleagues around the world, as I said, from US to Germany, Australia, we are very grateful to all of them. So I would like to start with this acknowledgement. So there is a preprint uh, already available. So in case you want to read the details or you want to express your feedback, uh, at the bottom of the slide, you find the preprint link. So first of all, how we got there. So we have been investigating traumatic brain injury, which is one of the topics that we follow in the laboratory. And for uh, several reasons, we were investigating the impact on traumatic brain injury and neuroinflammation and uh, other modulators of this condition, such as uh, ethanol intoxication in trauma. And if you want to know why ethanol intoxication, well, there are many good reasons, but one which would not be a minor one, we got funded to do so. So would not be kind to refuse. We, when we screened the, the expression of cytokines in the cortex and the hippocampus of mice uh, undergoing a mild TBI, we found uh, among the many cytokines that we were looking for, we found a very distinct upregulation of interleukin-13 which was quite unexpected because there were no lymphocytes uh, at this stage. And also because the level of expression was way higher than uh, other cytokines. L looked like uh, either there was a very large source of interleukin 13 in the brain or we were badly mistaken. So I sent everyone back to the lab to do a confirmation experiment with something else. And Florian, used the in, in situ hybridization to localize interleukin-13 mRNA, and it ended up in the hippocampus being, well, concentrated exclusively in neuronal nuclei. This, this uh, evoked quite some interest. So there is an interleukin that is known for other functions that is suddenly expressed in the nucleus of neurons, so in the cell body, and therefore, it has neuronal roles. What is this stuff doing there? Why there is so much of it and, and why it is there and, and why there is so much even more in TBI? So we named it a fascinating event. And this was somehow also uh, fitting with a recent trend that has been started by Anna Molovsky and, and Jonathan Kipnis in very good laboratories. And I advise all of you if you are interested in the field to check the publications, they are really great. On the possibility that interleukins are somehow used in the CNS for functions that are not directly related to what they are actually doing in the immune system. In fact, just to be all on the same page, what is interleukin normally doing? So interleukin 33 is, uh, is known since 30 years has been extensively studied in the field of allergy and asthma as one of the strong mediators of uh, IgE switch. So as an inducer of IgE switch in B cells, 
is an inducer of uh, hypertrophy of the mucosa and uh, the smooth muscle cells in the airways, so, so it's related to, to asthma. And it is even before this stage was being discovered as an effector of the antiparasite response. So we have a cytokine that is normally designed to, to fight against the infestations and uh, is involved in, in allergy that suddenly pops up in the brain for unknown reasons. We found this a very interesting topic to investigate. Although I must say it started like all the good projects as a side project for sure. And to make a long story short, we went into uh, the mouse brain and we verified that there was actually immunoreactivity for interleukin 13 and for its receptor. But in order to see where this was really happening, we decided to use a simpler with less crowding like a dissociated culture. And this, what you see here, are dissociated cultures uh, from rats. And the strange thing that we noticed uh, upon immunostaining is that we got a punctate immunostaining. Now, I have been working on synapses for many years. Uh, in my PhD, I did most of this. And so it reminded me that this was clearly synaptic staining. And therefore I sent Shun back to the lab to redo the staining. So, so why do you get a cytokine that suddenly looks like a synaptic protein? And this came over and over, always with very high quality. And so we started questioning whether it may be actually that we are dealing with a new synaptic protein we are not aware of. You see that in Turkey 13, shows a very clear colocalization with the pre and post synaptic markers. And actually the more mature the synapse, the more likely they are to have interleukin 13 localization. And it's not alone, interleukin 13 receptor is also strongly enriched in synapses, as you can see here. Interleukin 13 has two receptors, A1 and A2. A2 seems to be highly expressed in astrocytes mainly, but A1 appear to be strongly expressed in, uh, in synapses, at least to co-localize in synapses. So this was the very first uh, trace that there might have been an overlooked component of synaptic physiology for 30 years, interleukin 13 and interleukin 13 receptor. Of course, we, one may wonder, are you sure that this is the case? Is this receptor really functional? So we went and checked for the phosphorylated receptor. So if we could find the phosphorylated receptor, then it would have meant that really the receptor is activated by something, hopefully the natural ligand. And indeed we found that most of the synaptic localization is concentrated in active receptors. So there is much more re receptor in the, in the neuron, which is somehow away from the synapses, but those that are in synapses appear to be highly functional since they are phosphorylated. We are very doubtful about everything. So we decided to recheck this finding. How, how could we confirm this? So Shun uh, practiced and perfected uh, a synaptic fractionation protocol which uses uh, centrifugation and density gradients to isolate and purify the different fraction of the neuron. It is a technique that is time honored and produced in this case, a very clear result. First of all, we could find interleukin 13 immunoreactivity in the homology and it was clearly enriched in a fraction that was positive for a presynaptic protein. So again, this is a synaptic enrichment of interleukin 13. Very surprising because things never look so good. Interleukin 13 receptor was also enriched in synapses, but with a strong preference for the presynaptic terminal. So a PSD 95 positive. So the immunostaining and the biochemical fractionation point toward a very precise localization of interleukin 13 and interleukin 13 receptor. And the fractionation even suggests that there might be a polarization of the synapse. So a pre to post signaling communication in which the presynaptic terminals 
is releasing interleukin 13, the postsynaptic terminal is actually expressing the receptor. That would be really great. So interleukin 13 would act not just as a mediator of neuroinflammation, but as a neurotransmitter or a neuromodulator in, in the worst case. Unfortunately, confocal microscopy does not allow the precise localization of proteins in the pre and postsynaptic terminals. So we employed a super resolution microscopy paradigm, and we are traditionally microscopists in our in my lab. So we like to employ optical technologies. We like to see things. So we used a, a, a super resolution microscopy to see whether the localization of interleukin could be pinpointed to a pre or a postsynaptic site, and that would get a more precise understanding of the possible functional roles. In fact, in single super resolved synapses, we believe that this has been resolved with a resolution of around 25 nanometers, so 10 times the normal optical resolution, more or less. We could see that interleukin 13 and uh, interleukin and, and PSD95 here in red were very rarely overlapping and actually most likely to be adjacent, adjacent to each other. Fitting of the, the intensity profile produced a consistent gap between the peak of PSD95 and the peak of interleukin 13, which you can see plotted here. On the other side, the interleukin 13 receptor showed a consistent overlap with PSD95, which on the, after a fitting produced a peak of the density distribution, very much overlapping with PSD95. So the super resolution microscopy seemed to have identified a location of interleukin 13 that is away from PSD95 and the location for interleukin receptor that overlays PSD95. We repeated the same experiment using bassoon, the presynaptic protein involved in vesicle release, as the presynaptic marker. And this produced a precisely mirror image. So interleukin 13 was now perfectly fitting with the peak of bassoon, indicating a presynaptic localization whereas interleukin 13 receptor was located away from the presynaptic terminals toward the shaft of the dendrite, so clearly in the postsynaptic side. This was a very, very interesting result because it was the first clear demonstration of what the fractionation had suggested, so that the pre- and postsynaptic proteins are actually polarized and interleukin 13 is presynaptic vesicle, located most likely, and the interleukin 13 receptor is postsynaptic. So at this point, we had no doubt, further doubt, that we were dealing with something new in synapses. We had showed it in the mouse brain, we had showed it by monostaining, we had showed it by immuno y fractionation. We have showed it in the red neurons, and we have showed it again using super resolution microscopy. So it, it should have been something related to that. And what are the sources of interleukin 13? Why it is, uh, it is induced in neurons? So if it is something that is dynamic, we would believe that it would change with neuronal So we went back to our trauma in, in interest. And, and using single molecule in situ hybridization, we once again detected very high level of interleukin 13 expressed in neuronal nuclei. This time we subject the animals to a mild trauma. And we saw that the RNA expression of interleukin 13 in the neuronal nuclei was substantially increased by trauma. So trauma is associated with excitatory inputs. So question is, is excitation driving interleukin 13? 
we made a, another experiment using chemiogenetics to inactivate parvalbubin interneurons and therefore suppressing perisomatic inhibition, increasing the baseline activity of neuronal um, cortical neurons. And once again, we found a substantial increase in the expression of interleukin 13 in the neurons of the cortex. I must note that not every neuron in the cortex expresses interleukin 13 at the same level. Some, there is a substantial amount of variability, which we have not completely understood, but for which we have ideas. And some neurons express much more than others. An interesting point here is that if we make the two manipulations together, so we inactivate the parvabubin interneurons using chemogenetics and we subject the mice to a light trauma, we don't get an additive effect. Again, I sent Florian back to the lab to see whether this was the case. And indeed, it seems that there is a plateau in the amount of interleukin 13 that these neurons produce. Once the plateau is reached, there is no further upregulation. At the time, this was an, an intriguing observation, and now we have further evidence that this is possibly meaningful. To confirm that we are dealing with a factor that is controlled by neuronal activity, so not a structural member of the synapses or constantly there, but continuously adapted and remodeled, we use a neuronal nuclear calcium buffer, genetically encoded, and we express all this construct with AVs by injecting the cortex. And when we block the neuronal nuclear calcium, we strongly downregulated interleukin 13 mRNA. Once again, suggesting that interleukin 13 is dynamically regulated by trauma through activity dependent mechanisms that involve a transcriptional regulation based on nuclear calcium. And we could still get some degree of induction, but much less if we also add a light trauma on the top. So this means that whatever interleukin-13 is doing, it is dynamically regulated by injury and by activity. And it is dishomogeneously expressed in neurons, suggesting that we may be dealing with some degree of plasticity or neuroprotective effect. Of course, we don't trust anyone, including and starting from ourselves. So since we found that uh, a cytokine that was also a neuronal protein and a synaptic mediator would, would be an extraordinary claim, we followed Carl Sagan's advice and we sought extraordinary evidence. So we uh, managed to acquire interleukin 13 knockout samples, brains. It took quite some effort from Florian and Schun to secure these samples because customs would not let uh, just pieces of mouse brain travel during a pandemic. But we could ev evaluate, first of all, that a first antibody that we have used for the staining produced almost no staining in the interleukin 13 knockout brain. And in the same brain, the probe that we use for in situ also produced no staining, no detection. So we have something that we have validated in the mouse, in the rat, with antibodies and RNA, with qPCR to confirm it. And the two tools have been validated in knockout. We were not satisfied yet. So this was an anti a mouse anti interleukin 13 antibody. So we decided to acquire a second antibody, a rabbit, a rise in rabbit, and redo the stainings. And we again produce a similar synaptic staining using a completely different antibody from a different source and a different host. At this point, even the most skeptical should eventually believe that we are indeed dealing with a, a real phenomenon, something that is going on there. So what is interleukin 13 doing? Why it is there? We made a simple experiment. We treated our cultured neurons with interleukin 13, 15 nanogram, for one hour or three hours. And then we used a, a phospho array, phospho antibody array, to look for the signaling cascades and the protein that were phospho related. 
where we got a certain number of hits at one hour that were mainly increase in phosphorylation of synaptic proteins. Once again, pointing that we are dealing with the synaptic process. Many of these are glutamate receptors and these phosphorylation sites are well known to correspond to events that trigger the insertion of glutamate receptor in the membrane. So they correspond to a potentiation of the glutamatergic response. And in agreement with this, we also found that CAM kinase 2 was also upregulated in phosphorylation, suggesting that the glutamatergic signaling was upregulated by interleukin 13 treatment. Proteins also appeared in the phosphoproteomics that included a number of presynaptic proteins, alpha synuclein, synapsin cytoskeletal proteins like tau, and the BDNF receptor, TREK B. This was quite interesting to see that the interleukin 13, which had this polarized way, so pre to post synaptic, had a large scale effect in the neuron, which corresponded to a phosphorylation of glutamate receptor, and then some effects in the presynaptic terminal. At three hours, after three hours of continuous stimulation, however, the phosphoproteome landscape was substantially different. And most of the glutamate receptors we had found upregulated in phosphorylation were actually substantially downregulated. So the effect of interleukin 13 on the glutamate receptor phosphorylation is not designed to last forever. It's designed to be somehow quickly homeostatically compensated. And so the receptors that are first up phosphorylated are down phosphorylated. We could still see the signal in the CAM kinase phosphorylation and in the, in the number of presynaptic terminals. So the long-term signaling triggered by glutamate receptors and so the CAM kinase activation is persistent in these neurons. And so are the presynaptic changes. So in interleukin 13, this allergy related and L means fighting related cytokine is controlling the long-term plasticity pathways that are quite well understood. And we found that the, the signaling pathways involved were quite broad. We found CAM kinase 2, CDK5, GSK3 beta, ERK, PKA among this, the, the most prominent suggesting a large scale change in the signaling architecture of the neurons. So where are all this signaling going? Well, if I mentioned to you CAM kinase 2 and PKA and ERK, you would quickly ask me whether nuclear uh, transcription factors were also phosphorylated. And in fact, one, the first thing that we did after checking this was to go and, and see what happened to phosphocreb, the most obvious target. And we found a massive upregulation in phosphocreb phosphorylation after one hour and a persistent phosphorylation after three hours. And since we never trust anything, we also verified that there was an upregulation of the phosphorylation of the receptor itself, like we had already seen in the native conditions, and of course of phosphoerc. So uh, com confirming the phosphoray data with uh, an independent technique. And the phosphocreb uh, upregulation was associated with the phosphocreb stereotypical response in terms of other transcription factors like DREAM, ATF3, a number of others, and a full battery of immediate early genes, which are normally associated with increased neuronal activity, like CFOS. So we have a cytokine that is triggering at synaptic level glutamate receptor insertion presynaptic, but mainly postsynaptic changes that drive a response that looks a lot like increased synaptic uh, activity and increased neuronal firing. Now, before you ask, we have been trying to verify this by electrophysiology for a long time now. And we have not yet found a good model to do so. We look forward to any collaborator that would like to help us in this direction. The preliminary evidence that we have at the moment is that indeed interleukin 13 increase the neuronal firing very quickly within a few minutes of the application. And this we have seen in, uh, in arrays recording 
and uh, in the very few patch clamp recordings that we have been managed to obtain so far. Somehow in the line of the finding that uh, there was a plateau in the induction of interleukin 13, and also because Bruno Conti, one of the pioneers of the interleukin 13 neuroimmunology had found that actually interleukin 13 is toxic to neuron. We looked at whether any special effects may appear increasing the dose of interleukin 13. And actually we found that compared to baseline, we can increase the amount of phosphocreb with concentrations around 50 to 150 nanograms per milliliter in culture. But after that point, the effect is reversed and phosphocreb goes the other way around. So at high level of interleukin 13, phosphocreb is down phosphorylated back to baseline and below baseline. So we are dealing with this effector that is very tightly regulated. So we cannot exceed some degree of induction because depending on how much there is, the effect on downstream signaling can be phosphocreb up or down. So there is too much of a good thing. It is possible. It's possible that not enough interleukin 13 have, has some effect, but too much of it also has not necessarily good effect. What is happening downstream with interleukin 13? And can we further validate our idea that interleukin 13 is acting through glutamate receptor at synapses? So we performed a small molecule screening of a, a number of inhibitors targeting glutamate receptors and signaling kinases. And we use this to reconstruct the basics of the interleukin 13 to CREB signaling ar architecture. First of all, we found that the blockade of JEC and ERK was sufficient to block CREB phosphorylation. JEC and ERK are the prototypical signaling transduction kinases involved in cytokine signaling. So, we found that, uh, very surprisingly, in a specific blocker of STAT6, which is the prototypical transcription factor downstream of interleukin 13, was also reducing CREP phosphorylation. Whereas a, an inhibitor of STAT3, which is also involved in neuroinflammation, was completely ineffective. So we identified a, a classical interleukin 13 signaling cascade in neurons as responsible for the connection between synaptic interleukin 13 receptors and CREP. And all this was glutamate receptor sensitive. When we blockade AMPA receptor, NMDA receptor, or voltage dependent calcium channels, we also got a complete reversal of the interleukin 13 effect. So interleukin 13 has at least three different streams of signaling connecting the receptor to CREP. A, a prototypical JEC stat CREP pathway, which has never, never been described before, which is currently uh, object of question and investigation in my laboratory. We were never supposed to do these studies in the first place. So now that we have found something, we don't want to, to lose this a direct communication that may go through ERK, and also a number of indirect events going through glutamate receptor, CAM kinase, and PKA. In fact, inhibitors of CAM kinase and PKA also completely block CREP phosphorylation. So there is some degree of redundancy here, possibly. The interesting thing is that other inhibitors were not effective. CDK5 blockade produced no effect. Uh, GSK3 beta produced no effect. And we got a strange signal around TREC B. TREC B was among the most prominent proteins up phosphorylated in the, uh, the proteomic screening. If we block in TREC B, we get effects only at quite high doses of the inhibitor. Our thinking is that it must have something to do with the signaling, but we, we think that it might be more complex than just this. There might be 
recursive induction, which I'm going to depict better at the end in the cartoon. And so interleukin 13 is not activating track B directly, but it might do it somehow indirectly. What is the ultimate effect that we are looking at? So we are seeing increase in firing. Uh, how can we detect it? So electrophysiology, we are doing it at the moment. Calcium imaging, we, we, we have tried to do it. We will try to do. It's not the type of technologies we had at end, but we are pushing forward introducing it in our laboratory. We did a synaptic activity. So can we detect increase in the presynaptic cycle, so the cycling of the vesicles using an antisynaptotagmin feeding assay? So this is a, a simple assay in which antibodies that are directed against luminal epitopes of synaptotagmin are added to the culture medium. So every time synaptotagmin is exposed to the extracellular environment, antibodies can bind it and they are then internalized. And once they are internalized, they remain attached and therefore they mark all the synaptics, synapses that are active. Interleukin 13, coherently with all what we have found so far, also produced a substantial increase in the number of active synapses. So the firing of the neurons is most likely increased and this corresponds to an increased presynaptic uh, release of glutamate and this is also coherent with the increase in the phosphorylation of synapsins or increased availability of vesicles in the synapse. We use this assay to further validate the cascades and to be sure that indeed this was the case. And in fact, coherently with the expectations, JAK inhibitor and ERK inhibitor completely prevent this response. And surprisingly, once again, the transcriptional response regulated by STAT6 is also involved in the long-term regulation of synaptic activity. This is a phenotype appearing at three hours. And so in Telk 13 has this prototypical signaling pathway that is known to control uh, mucus production and IgEs, which in B cells, but is also active in neurons. Nobody knows what it is doing there. And we are trying to make inroads in this direction. Nobody knows. But it is quite important because it is related to Krebs phosphorylation and to synaptic activity. So in the brain, there is an active, right in this moment, in your brains like mine, and in yours more than mine, since I'm substantially older, synapses are releasing interleukin-13 and interleukin-13 receptor is activated and synaptic plasticity is probably triggered by this effect with a large scale transcriptional response. And then there is a completely independent cascade of interleukin 13 protecting you from ailments, hopefully not, or giving you allergy and pruritus. Is this true only for mice? We demonstrated this in mice and in, in rats. Is this an artifact of the mouse brain? Well, we went to the human brains and uh, Shun and uh, Umaima dedicated a lot of work to, to optimize the interleukin 13 staining in the human cortex. And we found at least three different types of cells that were clearly positive. So we had neurons that were strongly positive. These are very thin sections. And synapses all around them that were also quite positive. And we found some degree of immunoreactivity in neurons located in the lamina two, three, or in deeper lamina. And a second population of cells strongly expressing interleukin 13 was located in the white matter. So there is a population of glial cells expressing interleukin 13, which is critical for the white matter physiology. This is not completely surprising because if there was one thing known about interleukin 13 in the brain is that mutations in the interleukin 13 receptor 2 are driver of glioma proliferation. So there is a connection between interleukin 13 from neurons and astrocytes and there are cells in the white matter that are strongly producing interleukin 13 
they also express the other receptor, interleukin 13 receptor 2. And this may be an entry point connecting a mysterious mutation in glioblastoma to a normal neuronal response. Now, recently has been shown that gliomas do respond to neuronal input. We believe that interleukin 13 may be one mediator that could critically connect the two. Interleukin 13 receptor one is also strongly expressed in the human cortex. And these are very obviously neurons. And if one goes to high magnification, a punctate staining sort of tends to appear. Of course, the human histology is not as precise as the mouse histology. These are autopsy brains, heavily fixed, partially artifactual in, in some, to some extent. So one should not expect the same type of beautiful immunofluorescence that one can get from the mouse brain or the cultures. Still, this is a proof that whatever we are doing in the mouse and in the rat is meaningful for the humans. It's not an artifact. And this, and this also adds to the idea that we are not dealing with some strange stainings. We have shown this in, in rat brains, in mouse brains, and now also in human brains. But if there is something in the human brains, how it is then affected by the trauma. We are people who are involved in, in traumatic brain injury. So we have found a new factor there. And it is really upregulated in trauma and how much it is upregulated. Because depending on how much it is upregulated, it may be driving beneficial or detrimental effects. So thank to uh, Jenggui Li, a very talented neurosurgeon, which is also a molecular biologist. And we'd really love to have this cross-disciplinary expertise with us. We uh, made uh, a study on interleukin 13 expression in human cortex with samples obtained uh, in the vicinity of the trauma site that has been accessed for uh, neurosurgical treatment of the injury. And we found that interleukin 13 is strongly upregulated at transcriptional level in the human cortex subject to trauma. Interleukin 13 receptor, on the other hand, is not upregulated, but interleukin receptor 2 is substantially upregulated. So, coherently with the idea that here, a neuronal response and a glial response may be taking place at the same time but also coherent with the idea that it's not relevant which source interleukin-13 is coming from. The neurons would respond to interleukin-13 produced by lymphocytes as much as it responds from, to interleukin-13 produced by other neurons. And the same applies to astrocytes. Jonathan Kipnis has recently published a beautiful, really beautiful paper in Neuron about how interleukin-4 from lymphocytes may crosstalk to neurons. And I suggest you to really check his work because it's really great. And we have, of course, additional positive control showing that we are not dealing with necrotic tissue. We observe the upregulation of BDNF, NTNF alpha. And so this confirms that the human brain reacts like the mouse brain, upregulating delicate interference. We have some evidence, which I don't put here now in the, in, the, in the slides, showing that neurons co-express BDNF and interleukin-13, but the quantity is not directly related. So they may be responsible for different functions and possibly regulated differently. Can we make some inference about how interleukin-13 changes in the trauma brain? So we went for another set of samples. And this time we obtained CSF from Australia. In the CSF of patients suffering from TBI, we also observed a substantial upregulation of interleukin-13 with a distinct kinetic followed over time 
these patients displayed very high level of interleukin-13, which then declined over time and went sort of back to baseline after day four. Some patients never reached baseline. The usual inflammatory response actually showed the opposite effect. Started relatively low, in this case, this is TNF-alpha, and went up with time. So the interleukin-13 response we are seeing is not just a consequence of lymphocyte or neutrophile infiltration, which would then follow the other cytokines, but seems to be a very specific response happening only in the early phase. And look at the concentration. This is the CSF. We are dealing with concentration ranging from 40 to 50 nanograms per milliliter, comparable to what we have in the cultures, to values that are 100 times higher. What is the function of all this? Oh, the, the questions whether uh, damp recognition is also an inductor of interleukin 13. It is possible. And we believe that in, in this case, interleukin 33 may be responsible because an interleukin 33 to interleukin 13 axis has been described in other tissues. So it is possible, although not proven, that neurons that do express high level of interleukin 33 may actually also induce interleukin 13 as response. The question now is whether interleukin 13 is beneficial or non beneficial to the neurons. So we went back to the in vitro model and we used an holotomography live imaging system to observe the progression of excitotoxicity in cortical neurons in vitro. Do you hear me? Yes. I'm still online. Uh, yes, we can hear you. Yes. So in the oral tomography system, we can follow label free the cells over time and we can study their morphology. So we can pick subtle changes and um, identify signs of pathology very quickly without having to do any staining or introduce any additional protein. If you put glutamate at 20 micromoda, within a few hours, you are going to see nuclear condensation, cytoplasmic edema, the signs of excitotoxic death. Low dose interleukin 13, so 50 nano, nanogram per milliliter, produced a substantial beneficial effect. So the low dose interleukin 13 that is activating phosphocreb is actually protective. And this protection was largely abolished by JAK inhibitors and also to some extent by STAT6 inhibitors. So there is an interleukin 13 to STAT6 and possibly to phosphocreb protective mechanism that is acting in the acute phase of trauma. When there is excitotoxicity, interleukin 13 is protective. But if we administer to the cultures high doses of interleukin 13, 450 nanograms now, what we get is that we don't see the protective effect anymore. So like we have shown in the phosphocreb U-shaped dose response curve, this is not meaningless. It means that depending on how much interleukin-13 is there, we may have either beneficial effect or no effect or possibly even detrimental effect. And this is why interleukin-13 levels are so tightly regulated because too much of it is not necessarily a better thing. That's why we could not induce more interleukin-13 in the TBI model by suppressing, by, uh, suppressing the inhibition of PV interneurons because there must be some intrinsic system that regulates interleukin-13 levels to a very tight and beneficial range. And the question is, what happens in trauma when there is so much of interleukin-13? Possibly, at some point, interleukin-13 may switch to a non-effective cytokine anymore. This is an hypothesis that we are looking forward to verify. What do we know about the physiological relevance of all these things? Well, 
a few years ago, uh, papers were published uh, testing the cognitive profile of interleukin-13 knockout mice. And although the interpretation is controversial and the mechanism involved were totally unclear, what uh, the colleagues found was that this interleukin-13 knockout mice had problems in learning. In the water maze, in the reversal water maze test, it took to them much longer to reach the platform. And they never reached the short latencies during the reversal that wild type mice would reach. So all the mechanisms that I have described to you today are not irrelevant to the proper functioning of the brain. If you remove interleukin-13, you get some immune alterations, but most likely you also get a neuronal phenotype, not because immune cells are not entering the brain anymore, but most likely because interleukin-13 is an unrecognized modulator of neuronal function. So the future here would be to do a brain-specific interleukin-13 knockout and see what happens. And nobody has ever done that, well, because there was no reason to do it. So to wrap this up and then to come to a conclusion, we have found that there is a new player in synaptic biology. And this new player is interleukin-13. Interleukin-13 has a postsynaptic receptor, which is the classical interleukin-13 A1 interleukin-4 receptor, which has direct signaling to STAT6 and through glutamate receptor, and possibly also through BDNF, access the synaptic plasticity signaling, the classical synaptic plasticity signaling. So we have a new modulator of synaptic plasticity, which is interleukin-13, coherently with the memory impairment in interleukin-13 knockout mice. And we have an effect on neuronal survival and on synaptic activity. And this may be a place where a crosstalk between immune system and neurons may take place. There are many types of immune cells that produce interleukin-13. What happens when they reach the brain? Is the concentration high enough to be toxic? Is low enough to be neuroprotective? Well, there are still many questions open. So we would like to think that a good piece of science answers a few questions, but then opens up many more other questions. So what is the real physiological role of neuron 13? The fact that there is a patchwork of high expressing and relatively low expressing neurons in the, in the cortex and the hippocampus suggests that this may be related to some circuit specific plasticity. Some neurons undergo plasticity and therefore they go up with interleukin 13. How it is induced? Well, we believe that there might be some relationship with interleukin 33. What is the effect of BDNF? Why interleukin 13 requires or involves the track B receptor? It is because increased neuronal firing, like Florian thinks, or because interleukin 13 receptor may somehow heterodimerize with the track B, like other things. What is the effect of neuronal or stat six, which nobody knows? Shun has put a bet with me. There is one. We are going to find it. Is there a presynaptic interleukin 13 system? So all these presynaptic proteins are phosphorylated as a, the result of increased neuronal firing, or there is a small amount of in, presynaptic interleukin 13, like an autoreceptor. There are many cases described like the fractionation shows a small amount in the presynaptic terminal, maybe too small to detect by microscopy. So Florian believes that there is, I believe that there is not. We are going to see who is right. And with this, I come to the conclusion. I thank all of you for your attention. I would like to thank my funding sources, the SFB Trauma, DFG, the European funding to the Iranet Neuron, the Hannelore called Stiftung, the China Scholarship Council that supports Shun and uh, very many agencies that fund the work in my lab. And I would like to thank you for your attention. And of course, I wish you to live long and prosper.